Aloha and welcome to The Creative Life, a collaborative production between the American Creativity Association, Austin Global, and Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Darlene Boyd, and co-hosting with me is Kelly Oto, CEO and founder of Unitas International and an educational consultant. Kelly and our guest, Kamiko Mar, Executive Director of Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages, and Judge Glenn Yabuno, all are descendants of camp internees. We anticipate this being a two-part show with part one focusing on camp pilgrimages and their importance in keeping the history of Japanese internment alive. You're all descendants, and could we just start out by you telling me what your relationship was to the descendant? My father and my grandfather and grandmother and their children were interned. My grandfather was considered a community leader, so he was actually carted away to jail, separated from the rest of the family. But uh, my grandparents and my father and his siblings were injured. Thank you. And Kamiko? Uh, well, actually, Kelly, I didn't know that about your grandfather. My great-grandfather was also taken by the FBI, but he was not a community leader. He was just a farmer. Um, but my grandparents and my mom, uncle, aunt, they were all uh, incarcerated in Topaz, Utah. And Glenn? Uh, both sets of grandparents, uh, as well as both my mother and father and their siblings were uh, incarcerated. My mom's family was in uh, Gila, Arizona, and my dad's family was taken to Jerome, Arkansas. So, so today we've, we've decided to talk about the pilgrimages, and certainly it's not something that uh, I suspect many of our viewers may or may not be familiar with that whole process. And in our dialogue in preparation for the show, uh, certainly growing up, my parents had, had mentioned and talked about the camps, as did people in the neighborhood, but never with the intimacy that I've learned from each of you. And of course, I was on the East Coast, and it was quite California internment camp seemed so far away. Since then, I've crossed paths with some folks around here that may not be descendants, but they've talked about living across the street, for example, from Santa Anita, and looking at people at the fence, children their age. So I think we have a lot to share today. And I appreciate that you've chosen uh, to talk today in, in part one about pilgrimages. So Kamiko, since, since that's your specialty, start us off. Why pilgrimages and, and why is, do you feel that's a priority for us today in part one? Um, yeah, I, I've been lucky enough to be able to attend pilgrimages at there were 10 uh, sites in the in the continental United States and that is uh, where I've attended pilgrimages to most of them I've been able to visit all of them um, but I didn't know what pilgrimage was until probably seven eight years ago when I was invited to go to my first one I had no idea what it what it even was but I said, sure. Uh, so I ended up attending the Minidoka pilgrimage, which is in Idaho. And that was life-changing for me because I grew up in Missouri. So I didn't grow up around any other Asian Americans, let alone Japanese Americans. And when I was just surrounded in a community full of people who looked like me, had similar stories of me, looked like my, you know, grandma, grandpa, it, there was just a different feeling like my body almost could just relax a little bit. It sounds a little hippy dippy, but I just felt safe in a safe space. And so I decided that I wanted to attend all of these and um, the camp that Glenn's family was in Jerome, I actually uh, ended up doing a pilgrimage in 2018, the first one that I put on myself to the two camps that were in Arkansas. And um, I don't have a direct connection to those camps, um, but I saw that there wasn't any regular event there. And I wanted to, I wanted people from those two camps to be able to experience what I experienced at Minidoka. And so then Glenn, I think you came on the 2019 one right. on the second one. And that's how Glenn and I met. 
what can a participant expect to experience if they should sign up for a, a tour, a pilgrimage? I slipped in there saying tour because it's not a tour, pilgrimage. There's history involved and there's faith involved. Um, so what can one ex expect? I leave that to Glenn. Glenn, you were you were an actual pilgrim. You 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 tell us what you experienced. Sure. Uh, I think the main benefit uh, and what you'll experience is meeting so many other people. Uh, there were a number of former internees uh, that were still uh, with us and able to attend the pilgrimages. Uh, most of them were younger children uh, when they were in the camps. Uh, as far as Jerome and Roar. Uh, there's not a lot left of the camps themselves, but it does give you an idea of the environment where my parents were, uh, what it was like out there, and uh, there is a museum. And at the museum, I was fortunate enough to uh, find newsletters uh, where my father was listed uh, as the camp optometrist. Uh, there was a yearbook where my aunt was attending high school there. Uh, so I think it's the connections that you make. You get information about the history of the area and the history of that particular camp. Uh, but you make the connections with those that were there and their family members. And I think that's invaluable. Seems to me that it would be certainly invaluable. How much in, in your life growing up, well, any one of you can answer this, of course, uh, or, may, or perhaps all of you would want to share. How much did you, your parents and family share about this? Was it something that they, they chose not to? And if so, what was what do you think their reasons are? Perhaps you would only be speculating at this point. Kelly, what, what do you think? Uh, my family was in Gila River, Arizona. And I remember as a child, my dad took us, me and my sister, um, to see him. And it was just barbed wire left and just some holes in the ground and cement and wire sticking up and maybe remnants of wood barracks. But um, it, was, it was very quiet and silent. But because we were so young, he, he was actually an older, he was in his 20s when he was intern. So he was old enough to understand what was happening. He um, pointed to a hole in the ground and he said, that's where we used to play poker because you're talking to two young little girls, not understanding what this was really all about. But it was impactful because you start to realize parents, grandparents didn't speak about internment because in in our culture, I think we talk very much about. Um, being stoic, being strong, you persevere, you work hard. I remember my grandmother always told me, just work hard, study hard, and you will succeed. And so you didn't talk about the internment camp. And that is really unfortunate because now at my stage and age, I look back and I think, what a terrible injustice. I would do that, right? <laughs> in this day and age, but they did. And you see those photos of folks being rounded up behind barbed wires and some of the photos of kids with smiles on their faces. Kimiko, you mentioned the fact that these were actually, right, not doctor photos, but right, you're supposed to smile and take Propaganda. Off. Propaganda. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit more about that as well? Well, actually, so I, uh, if, you, if you could bring up the photo number one, this is a, a picture of, this is not a propaganda photo, which is why everybody's frowning. <laughs> um, but that is my grandmother. Um, she's holding my aunt and my, she's, my mom is holding her hand and then my uncle is to her side. So I think if uh, you were to see the government photos, they're, they're typically a little bit more smiley and um they're doing something they like children might be playing in a sandbox or the men might be you know golfing or doing something that 
seems like, oh, this was fine. It was like a resort. Um, whereas some of the, uh, I'm very lucky to, to be able to have actual family photos um, because cameras were not originally allowed into the camp. Um, but to see kind of the the real faces, the the faces that I know, <laughs> these are the faces that I see. Um, and so it it really, and also just looking at how young my grandmother was, I think she was only in her mid twenties and had three children and was put, you know, in a horse stall at, at, in the beginning. It, it just strikes a different tone than some of the more smiley photographs, you know, Ansel Adams took photographs, Dorothea Lange took photographs. I mean, there were very famous photographers that photographed uh, the camps and even some of their photos were impounded because they didn't look happy enough or or I think they were not supposed to shoot barbed wire in the in their images and Dorothea Lane did sometimes and they did not you know release those photos you can see them now but you you were you weren't able to see them then so they were trying to make it look at like it was not that big of a deal for folks that everybody was having a good time Glenn, where were the camps located approximately and, and how many of them were and how many people were interred? Uh, there were, correct me if I'm wrong, can we go 10 camps? Uh, they were located uh, in Minidoka, Idaho, uh, Jerome and Roar, you know, Arkansas, Gila, Arizona, uh, Topaz, Utah, Park Mountain, Wyoming. Uh, I know there was one in Tule Lake in California. There was one in Manzanar in California. Uh, and I, I know I missed something there, Kimiko, but there were approximately- Poston, Poston in Arizona Poston. And, Poston. and Amachi in Colorado. Thank you, Poston. Uh, so there were two in Arizona and then Amachi in Colorado. Approximately 122,000 plus were interned, uh, primarily West Coast. Uh, Japanese Americans uh, in those variety of camps. Some closed earlier than others. Jerome and Roar were two of them. And uh, those who remain, who were not released early for various reasons, pretty much went to Gila, uh, where my uh, grandparents on my mother's side were interned throughout the entire world. Uh, my dad ended up in Gila. Uh, and never knew my mom's parents or my mom at the, uh, at that time. They met afterwards. Nico, what what can you tell us about the, or or perhaps you also, Glenn, uh, about the process? How how were people taken away? How much notice were they given? I'm sure it 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 was shocking, pleasant, and and not pleasant, and probably very frightening. And families, I I. I read have been were not connected together, so someone might lose part. Not their children may not be with them. So tell us a little bit about that, Kimiko. Well, I think for the most part, people were given about a week's notice. They knew that something was happening, um, but what the government did is they separated the different areas along the west coast into zones that. Um, they would announce like in the newspaper a week before, or they would put up signs, you know, to all persons of Japanese ancestry. They would nail signs up around town to say, you know, if you live, and they would give the streets, uh, you know, between the, this area, you have to report to this place by, and it's usually was a week. And, and that's kind of where, Darlene, when you mentioned the only what we could carry, that that's they were told, they were given a list of things that they should bring um, and things that they should not bring. And obviously any kind of uh, radios, uh, photo, you know, uh, cameras, things like that were not allowed, weapons, obviously, uh, and animals. So, you know, there's a, a lot of heartbreaking stories of people who had to leave their pets behind or some of them killed their pets, I, you know, rather than, I, I, I know, it's, I don't want to, I don't want to be too much of a downer, but you know, there, there is a lot of, of trauma with that, not just with like material losses, but also family pets. And, and one of the other 
things that that happened that that um with dart so with with kelly's grandfather my great-grandfather being taken by the fbi that ha usually happened um way before the uh, families had to go they would be picked up no notice um, my mom's cousins remember that, you know, the, these FBI men came and they kind of went through the house. They looked for weapons. Apparently they found a gun in the house. And my mom's cousin was like, we didn't have a gun. So I don't know where that came from. Um, and then he, you know, they were taken. And the, so the heads of the households for a lot of people were taken. And I think that just made it a lot easier for the, the families to be more compliant because you have, you might have a mother with small children and the head of the household is gone and they don't know where they, where he is. So there's a lot of things that were kind of put into place beforehand to make it easier for, for people to be compliant. Take us back to, to the, the concept of pilgrimages. What can... What can one expect to experience if one decides to take a pilgrimage? And uh, once again, how typically how many people will be at a particular pilgrimage? Or how many can be accommodated? It's totally dependent on the site. So each one of the sites has their own group that puts on the pilgrimage. And so they each have their own personality dependent on the group that is doing it. And pilgrimages. Uh, can be different. So, so like the largest one would be in Manzanar, that pilgrimage is an afternoon um, and there can be thousands of people there. Whereas uh, the pilgrimage that I did that Glenn came on, I think I had a little over a hundred people there and it was three and a half days. So it's just, it, it really just depends on the, the people that are putting on the pilgrimage. I, I happen to like the ones that are over multiple days because I feel like people get to know each other. They have breakfast together. They see each other in the hallway or in the elevator, or they even go sightseeing together. And, and I just feel like that is a, um, a benefit about having the multi-day. So those are the ones that I, I like, and those are the ones that I, I put on, but there are different varieties for sure. When you mentioned the multi-days, then the pilgrims would stay in a hotel. Yeah. And come together for for meals at the campsite possibly? Typically, we don't do that much at the site itself. And, and as Glenn had said before, there's really nothing left of the two camps that are in Arkansas. Some of the other camps are National Park Service sites, so they have a little bit more infrastructure. But I feel like the, and Glenn, maybe you can speak to this, but I, I feel like the power of the site is just physically being there. You don't have to even really be able to see things or tour things. I, I feel like there's, you know, a sense of the ancestors being there or of the people who have passed there with you. And, and so it's just a very emotional moment, I think, for especially not just if your family was in that specific camp, but especially if it is, you know, I know when I, was able to visit the site where uh, my family was at. I, it's out in the middle of nowhere in the desert in Utah, and I ran, just burst into tears. Didn't know where it came from. It just bubbled up, and I just kept thinking of my grandparents being there, and just burst into tears. Um, but also, I think the power of pilgrimage is not just the place, which is super important. It's also the community and being able to share stories since most of us didn't grow up with any really detailed stories about camp life, that's almost how we learn is just by sharing other stories of funny things, you know, where they used to, a hole they used to play poker in or the fence that the kids used to crawl through and put soda pop for the locals to swap out, you know, all of those types of things, you know, you don't hear, they're not in books. You only get them from, from sharing the stories with each other. Are there sufficient numbers of survivors that are committed to share the story that participate in, in the pilgrimage? So that can the attendees encounter a conversation with anyone that is a survivor? Is that arranged? Uh, yes. I mean, we definitely try to get elders to, to come. Um, 
but as it was mentioned before, the ones who are like my mother was two in camp. She's 83 now. So, and she's considered it a young one. Um, we had a, we had a, a gentleman come to our Arkansas pilgrimage last year who was almost 102. And that was a real treat and a treasure. And, and that's why I think it's really important that um, folks go on these pilgrimages now because there is not going to be five more years of having survivors there. I, you know, I don't want to be morbid, but you have to consider that, you know, these stories will be lost if you aren't, if you aren't able to go and ask questions of the survivors and the ones who come, they are definitely willing to talk and share their stories. Um, and, and they're treated like rock stars, you know, people just fawn over them. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to see the elders get that kind of attention. Um, from young people that just want to, you know, go up and take pictures with them and talk and ask questions that, you know, that feels good for me. And you use the word treasure. And I know you have a photo of two little darling treasures. Perhaps we could call that photo. I think that's the number two. <laughs> so, so that's my mom and my aunt. And their faces look exactly the same. They make that same <laughs> frowny face. <laughs> um, but this is one of my favorite photos because it's, I, you know, I don't know. It's not posed. It, they're very serious. They're, they're frowny. My aunt's diaper's falling down, you know, <laughs> like it's just kind of like feels like a real photo. And I, I, I like that one. And I'm very lucky that both of them are still around. So it is one of my favorite photos of camp. Glenn, I, I'm curious, darling, how, Glenn, why did you choose to go on a pilgrimage and what was the impact that it had on you? Well, I chose, I specifically chose the one Kimiko had in 2019 uh, because it was going back to Jerome and Roar, where my dad and his family were. So I wanted to see what it was like to be in that particular area because. Imagine coming from Southern, well, Central California is where they were, Central California to Arkansas uh, to live. And literally, you know, you were put in trains and trained out there uh, with basically all, all you had was a couple suitcases. Uh, and so, you know, it was important to, you know, just see the area uh, and then to speak to some people who were there. Uh, to, to see what camp life was like. So, you know, that's why I particularly chose uh, the Jerome Roar. But I think it's important for any pilgrimage because you have a chance to meet the internees. You have a chance, uh, based on some of the educational opportunities, to learn something about the history of the incarceration, uh, you know, learning from the mistakes, so to speak. Uh, fortunately, at that one, we also had an exhibit from the Japanese American National Museum of artwork and uh, handiwork that some of their uh, survivors had done. Chairs, uh, birds, pictures, carvings, to see you know what was done in camp during uh, by some people during the incarceration. So it gave you a full sense of the history uh, of that particular time. I believe you have another photo before we uh, need to close here to, for, for this se session, part one. Uh, but you, oh, there it is. Uh, so that's that's my extended family. My um, great grandmother is the one that's grabbing my bratty mother, who's trying to run out of the photo. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she actually had nineteen children, uh, no twins. Wow. Yes. Only about nine what? of them lived to adulthood, but all of them were in that camp. Uh, so they were all in Topaz together. Um, and that's a lot of the, the brothers and their wives um, at the time. And then some of the younger brothers were in high school in camp. So they ranged from my grandpa was the oldest in his mid-20s, and then they had high school aged uh, brothers there too. So... <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, that's a whole other half hour about my great grandma, <laughs> my great grandma and her 19, 19 children. Um, but yeah, that that's just a, it's another 
again, family photo to see that they, they, you know, a lot of families were allowed to stay together. Um, there were certain reasons why families did get split. And also just if you, if you didn't live near your family, if you went to central California or you went to Southern California or Washington, you would be in a completely different camp than your parents. Like if you were an adult child that, you know, moved up to Sacramento from LA, you would not be in the same camp as your, as your family. So that probably was really rough. I have a, the next question I have for, for all of you is, and, and um, it's one that I have for one, all, all of you. And I think I know the answer to this. If, if one is not of Asian descent, is it beneficial for one to attend? I think so. No, yeah. Absolutely. I believe it's very important because it's an important part of history. Uh, plus, it gives you uh, interpersonal perspectives and understanding uh, of the climate back then during the Second World War. And uh, I think no matter what race, it's it would be beneficial to attend one of these pilgrimages. Uh, I, I don't want to necessarily get hung up on the 19 children, but there could <laughs> Yeah. Or that one family alone with 19 children. Wow. Yes. Uh, so our plans for, for part two for our viewers to understand, uh, there's quite a lot to be said and related to Hawaii. And Kamiko has mentioned that, that she'll be helping us with uh, with those vignettes. And so that is, that is our plan for part two. So we, we look forward to bringing this team back together. And in the meantime, uh, I'm very grateful. There's a lot to be found and to read about internment camps for those of you who are watching this and have not even thought about them. And it's it's very moving and it's very revealing. And it's also haunting to think that perhaps we being those of us that are, are not of Asian descent, uh, pass them off and sometimes because Life seemed like it was going on in a normal pace. As you said, they attend high school in some cases and other situations. Some folks met in the camp and married, uh, but life wasn't so great either when they came back. And we'll probably talk a little bit about that the next time. So in the meantime, you've been watching The Creative Life on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we have been discussing the importance of keeping history alive related to Japanese and camp pilgrimages. We invite you to join us again in a few weeks for part two. In the meantime, thank you for joining us and aloha. Mm -hmm.